Maybe your shortest quote in as far as the chapter heading quotes in all of Finding Bagpipe Freedom, but maybe the deepest and most important. Wax on, wax off. Mr. Miyagi. I know. It's definitely definitely my favorite one. Yeah. It's gotta be. You do it's from like the greatest movie. movie of all time, mm -hmm. Jim. Yeah, where's the headband actually? Do you have your headband at hand? This No, I just I only want to bring that out on special occasions. Oh, okay. It is right. It is right. Oh, yeah. There, so though, never too far away. It. Yeah. If I'm ever having a bad practice session, it's right there. Mm -hmm. Crane kick scene, I thought, was gonna be like the greatest scene of the entire movie. And and I think in the chap either in this chapter or elsewhere in the book, that does come up. Hey, maybe that is the best one, but maybe this one's the greatest in its import, perhaps, its significance, its influence on the rest of the film. I think the flaw with the crane kick is like if do right, no can defense, right? Mm -hmm. It's the idea that there's like this perfect move that no one can defense. Is that like uh, the deus ex machina error of the Karate Kid movie? It could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be. Like, and, I, and therefore, like the crane kick scene's cool. It gets, the, it gets the feels going and everything, but it's maybe not the most realistic. But meanwhile, the, uh, what did I say was the best scene? It was at the one where Mr. Miyagi teaches him like what all the hard work has built up to, or think, is it just wax on, wax off in general? I th There's so many great scenes. Let's see. I think that was it. Wax on, wax off. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. When he shows him that he's unwittingly mastered the foundations of self-defense. Yes. Danielson is done. He's ready to leave. And Mr. Miyagi's, Danielson, show me. Wax on, wax off. That's the scene. Yeah. Yes. And that's really cool. Mm. I do remember yeah. the very also first time probably, I watched that movie and that scene standing out for sure. I definitely remember that. Oh. You're like, oh. Paint the house. What? What? Or yeah, exactly. Pencil, and yeah. Um, I, obviously that is also slightly realistic. And it's also quite different than what we're doing when we're learning bagpipes, I think. Mm. Because karate for Daniel's son is like definitely an inelastic good. Mm. You know what I mean? He feels his life and his way of life is seriously in danger without learning to defend himself, mm. right? That's different for Pipers. So there, it's not an exact connection mm. because for Pipers, this is like an optional thing. This is like way further up Maslow's hierarchy of needs for us when we learn the bagpipe. So it's a little bit different, but I think the thing that really stands out is Daniel San can achieve what he wants to be able to do through mastery of the fundamentals. And it can be a tough slog, right? It can be a tough slog to master those fundamental motions. And Mr. Miyagi knows this. And so that's why he just starts him off with difficult tasks. It's like he's breaking down his ego, I think, in the process of doing that. And then it's also just creatively finding functional ways mm. for Daniel to learn those building blocks and the building blocks are the key element and right so i my those of my many plethora of children who have so far started learning music none of them likes it when i start doing this like i'm a metronome and yeah. all of them hates it when i pull out the actual metronome and i try telling them all the time look i know you hate this right now right but you'll be so happy later. And, and they have encountered mm -hmm. situations now where like some of my two oldest kids have started trying to like record stuff into GarageBand and other DAWs in order to make their own music. And I'm like, this is where you, if you line it up with the metronome, then all the pieces you build later, like it all lines up. And mm -hmm. but they did. They are not excited about building blocks. It's part of human nature. It's not just my kid. It's right. All of us. Yeah. So just to draw on Karate Kid. And it's maybe something. I could use more thought even in, in the dojo methodology in general, but it's, is there a way to take it from painful activity that you have to slog through mm. to some sort of misdirection that gets you where you need to go without the discomfort? I wonder mm. like the, uh, the best thing you want to know what to do with your kids, which I haven't done because I don't have any video game consoles, but just get dance, dance revolution. That's how you get the, the rhythm kids. into them. Yeah. And then that, what are you doing when you do that? You're practicing rhythmic accuracy with your extremities, mm. which is what you need to be able to do on the bagpipes. 
Like, man, I wish I had that when I was a kid. And by the way, you also get physical activity and other stuff too. But what are you really doing there? And then you could also use the rock band game, which is the same premise, just with like artificial instruments. Those rock band games, like that would be an amazing way to enjoy the process of developing basic rhythmic accuracy skills. There is some translation eventually that'll have to happen. Mm. But if you have those, and I'm not a brain scientist, hopefully this doesn't offend anyone on the internet, but make those neural connections mm. between, between time and then how to, coordinate, how to coordinate bodily actions really accurately as time passes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the, it, it does occur to me that like the idea, at least like the famous gorilla song, right? Clint Eastwood, rhythm, you have it or you don't. That's a fallacy, right? It makes you think, there's something inborn in humanity about this, especially when it comes to like maybe communal activities, right? And yet it is also a skill that needs to be developed. And, and it's, I think it's objectively correct, right? Mm. So rhythmic accuracy, you either have it or you don't. That's true. Uh -huh. mm. But what's implied here is you either have it from birth or you don't. And that's a foul. So anybody can acquire it. It's a skill that, that requires development. So either you do currently have the ability to to control the timing of your rhythm or you don't. I think that's a true statement. Mm. And we need to develop that skill such that we do in order for very much bagpipe finger work to go correctly. For example, I don't know if anyone listening right now has crossing noises, but what is a crossing noise, right? A crossing noise is some fingers moving at a certain time that we don't intend them to move. What's the little secret word snuck into that sentence? It's time. And then, so what are we actually implying here? We're implying that our rhythmic accuracy is out of line, right? Yeah. Something is happening at the wrong time. So we have to develop our ability to move our fingers at specific times. Mm. That's, that's more a rhythmic accuracy problem than it is a finger problem. A lot of people are like, man, I just suck at, I, I can't get rid of my crossing noises. And I guess my fingers are just too old or too slow. And it's, what do your fingers have to do with it? Mm. Only something at, you know, only the, your fingers and how capable they are, only a small part of the equation. Do you understand the rhythm you're trying to produce here? Oh, what do you know? Mm. What a strange coincidence, right? You can't just clap the rhythm of this passage accurately. It shouldn't be any surprise that the fingers are not wiggling the way you want them to either, because yeah. the, the fingers all need to move at certain times, right? Rhythm is the foundation of that. Mm. Another thing to think about is you can't play the scale absent rhythm, mm. right? Like if you want to play nine notes of the scale, all those nine notes have to be arranged across time in some way. It's even just the mechanics of switching from one note to the next. If I'm going to go from C to E, four different fingers have to either lift or drop at the same time, right? It's Correct. a timing thing. And so even just the action. It's not a question of quarter notes and 16th notes. It's the mechanics of playing the notes. Have to that's exactly right. So let's, that's exactly right. So let's drill into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And again, we're talking about rhythm here. Rhythm is the foundation of, I think, all other finger work fundamentals, right? We're assuming control over when things happen. So here we're going from C to E. What do we got? We got these two fingers have to drop, okay? But if these two fingers don't lift simultaneously, we'll have a crossing noise, right? So if these drop too early, we'll hear a low G, right? Uh, before we lift these fingers up. And there's other things that could happen. For example, if the E and the low A fingers come up early, what do we have temporarily before the C fingers close? We have temporarily a, a big false note here. Mm -hmm. Right now, that's, that might not be as egregious as the low G crossing noise, but that's still going to cause pretty big lack of clarity during your note change. And that's an unintended sound. We don't intend, we don't want. Yeah. So that's a crossing noise too. We nickname those phantom crossing noises because mm. they're not like explicitly horrendous, but they do contribute a lot to sloppiness. What do we really need? C fingers go down, these guys go up, same time. Okay. These fingers need to go down. And these fingers need to go up at the same time. But then what time is that? Mm. Right? Let's pretend that note change should happen on the beat in a piece of music. That means the beat is that exact moment where those fingers need to hit the chanter and the other fingers need to come off the chanter, right? It all has to happen simultaneously at that point. 
So now if we set up a metronome and, we, and it's clicking at 60 beats per minute, all right, if we don't have the ability to time musical events with control to that metronome, I'm just gonna, here's our metronome and then Right. If I'm just approximate with my uh, clicking to that metronome, and that's the best I can do, what do you think is going to happen when we start to add other things layering on top of that, yeah. like note changes and grace notes? Right. If I if that's the closest I can get, we're going to have problems. So what I can do is I can practice. I can practice being a little bit more accurate yeah. to the click. Okay, and I can also practice different idioms and stuff like that. And by the way, it's that wasn't really perfect there, but it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. During a practice session, I might get warmed up with a little bit of rhythm, just getting myself into that groove and feeling it. Okay, because that's a necessary prerequisite to then being able to do stuff like note changes and grace notes and embellishments and expression. And don't forget expression, right? It's Jim, I want you to hold that note. What does that mean? Yeah. What is holding? Holding is something to do with, wait for it, rhythm, right? What we're talking about is when someone asks you to express a note by holding it, what we're talking about is extending the duration of that note. Duration is a timing word, right? And timing in, in, in the sense of music means rhythm. So even at the higher end of the expression, the deep and meaningful stuff, it's rhythm we're talking about. It's mm -hmm. timing. Yeah. Yeah, wax on, wax off, right? We have to develop a strong sense of timing. That's what the metronome is for. I think a lot of people see how much metronome stuff we do at the dojo and they say, I didn't learn how to play pipes that way. That method must just be like not quite right or something, or they're turning people into expressionless robots. But I would just, I would challenge that point of view and say, if those people spent more time with the metronome it would make them better players it, it not because you always play exactly rigidly to the metronome all the right. time but the metronome is a tool just like any other tool we might use in the world it's a tool to help you improve your sense of timing and your personal control yeah relative to an objective sense of time and it builds that skill set. So then, of course, when you're playing for an audience or for yourself and, and you want to insert more expression, more color, more timbres or whatever the different feelings and stuff are going to be, then you've got that skill set built up. It does feel a little bit awkward, maybe, to look at uh, much of the rest of the musical world for the last several hundred years and see in your mind's eye so many musicians with metronomes somewhere in their practice room and suggest that's all except us. We don't need those. Yeah. And how many musicians perform on stage with a metronome? I can't think of any. Uh, unless I it was like of, some I kind can of think of a bunch. Piece. Oh, really? No, I think I can think of a bunch. Yeah. So it's really common for musicians to use. Oh, uh, in their monitors and, and stuff. Their sure. ear I was thinking like your classic metronome with the TikTok, like in front of the sure. stage so everybody could see it. I, I see. Yeah. So how many musicians actually perform on stage with metronomes? And you'd be tempted to say musicians don't do that, mm -hmm. but it's, let's think about this for a second. First of all, some musicians literally will use click tracks in order to keep the band tight on stage, especially if it's a large group. I think you might be surprised. And you know, how many of those, at how least many have those the drummer in have it. a click track. Yeah. Yeah, so, so literally some musicians do use metronomes on stage. Okay, that's layer one. But then the other thing is, and you were just mentioning there, Jim. So when you play in a rock band, what is the drummer? Really now, the drummer, cool, might yeah. not be, the, the drummer might not be a machine that produces an objectively unvarying rhythm, but it is a very specific target that if your band wants to play tight, you're going to have to lock in with the drummer. Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is really the difference between the drummer and the metronome? Like maybe only that the drummer is a slightly more nuanced, but you still have to have the fundamental skill. I, okay, Jim, relax. <laughs> Don't say slightly no, more nuanced. Going, no, we're not going there today. The drummer might be slightly more nuanced. And then a cynic's view might be a drummer is going to be far less consistent than an mm -hmm. actual objective metronome, which is true, by the way. So as far as actual perfect presentation of the beat, 
I don't think any human could be as good as like a, a digital computer clock. So it will be less perfect. But my point here is not that drummers are imperfect. Hear me internet. That was not my point. Okay. My point is that effectively the drummer represents the same concept mm. when it comes to playing in an ensemble. And then even in a pipe band, what are we doing here? If me and Jim are in a pipe band, our objective is to play in unison with each other. What does that mean? Amongst a couple of other things, it means that we're playing at exactly the same time. Yeah. The music that we're playing is happening at the exact same time. And in order for him and I to create unison together, there needs to be some sort of specific reference point, and we need to have the ability to play with that reference point. And then finally, let's go to the solo piper. Oh, yes. They can do what they want. Solo pipers don't play with metronomes, but they, when they're on stage, they would never do that. But that's not true. It doesn't, really, it doesn't align with my experience. My experience is when I'm playing solo, I absolutely am performing in front of the judge with a metronome. Now, it's not a literal metronome, okay? But I do have a very clear vision in my mind of what I am trying to do. Yeah. And then I am trying to manifest that out into the real world on my bagpipe. So I'm still trying to align what my pipes are doing with a very specific idea in my head. And that requires timing control. Mm. If I only ever approximately time something to what I envision in my head, that's a big problem. Mm. It's going to cause negative comments on sheets more often than not, and so on and so forth. So the metronome is a great tool. It's a great objective tool to develop your sense of timing and your skill and your accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now I think a perfectly understandable, maybe even subconscious, like unexamined reaction to anybody saying you need to use a metronome to anybody who's already playing an instrument was expressed beautifully by one of my, one of my sons just a couple of weeks ago. Let me just keep talking about my kids all the time. Yeah. Someday when your they grow up, they're like, going to be so Your kids sound like incredible geniuses. Yeah. Well done. So my second son, he's sitting there playing piano and I'm like, okay, you know what? He's working on this piece that he's about to pass off later that week to his piano teacher. I was like, you know what? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to stop touching the keys and we're going to clap. And I turned on the metronome and they know when I'm reaching for the metronome button on the keyboard, like I'll go, no, dad. you know? <laughs> and he kind of, he kind of broke down a little bit. It was kind of a longer practice session. And, and when my wife came into the room to see if she could help, help things calm down a bit, he, what he said was, I don't like going back. I don't want to have to go back again. I already mm. am learning this piece. And I understand yeah. that sentiment. That is what it feels like. It feels like going backwards. And so what he and I have been working on now is understanding that like music isn't going to be like this perfectly linear experience where I did metronome when I was six years old and I never have to do metronome again because I've moved I beyond know. that. I, we're working on point, understanding. Jim. It's a cycle, right? Well this done. is something we do all the time. Thank you. If no one else in the world ever <laughs> tells me I'm a good dad, I want Andrew Douglas to yeah. tell me I'm a good dad. Fantastic dadding there, Jim. Yeah. No, you're right. And for me, it's like you're always continually, like you, you have to build the structure and then you have to continually maintain and develop the structure. Hmm. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, okay, so I'm going to build like a tree house. Not, I'm going to build like a house suspended above the ground. Right? So you could start with some cinder blocks and then build foundation on top of some cinder blocks and then build it, right? But then if you wanted to build a second story, and so, so you, maybe you could build a one-story house and it gets the job done. Mm -hmm. But then three buddies want to move in. It's not structurally sound enough and you need another floor. Okay. You could just build on top of that, but what you're, you're probably going to find structurally what you used to have is no longer good. Cinder blocks aren't going to do it. So now we're yeah. just going to have to pour a proper foundation probably mm -hmm. in order to be able to sustain like an actually properly sized house Yeah, with like plumbing and, and several rooms. So now we had to pour the full foundation. But then of course, now think about a hundred story skyscraper. A simple concrete foundation isn't going to do it. You're going to have, and again, I, I have no real idea here, but it seems to me like steel has played a large role in being able to construct like super tall buildings that can sustain a lot more people. It's you're gonna need you're gonna need better ideas and theories and math and materials over time in order to continue building the structure up and up. So the same goes with music. It's like you can have a very approximate sense of rhythm if all you want to do is play Twinkle Little Star 
and tongue the notes in between. You can have a very basic thing. But once you want to start doing, I don't know what a slightly more complex one would be, like maybe jingle bells or something with actual bagpiper grace notes, your sense of rhythm is going to have to be significantly more specific. And then we can talk about Abercarney Highlanders or Bonnie Ann, some of these most complex tunes that pipers might play. And then now your actual sense of rhythm and groove and specifics and how all the technique is supposed to tie into that. Now, if you don't have that down to a very specific degree, it's going to be a train wreck, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that you're going backwards. You're actually going forwards in the sense that, okay, now it's time to take that foundation and reinforce it even more and develop it even more. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a cyclical thing, I think. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, so I achieved that. Yeah. Now, in order to achieve the next level, okay, let's, we got to go back through and we got to address some new things. Yes. And I, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said all analogies limp. So probably there could, you could find some challenges with this analogy, but it, it is resonating with me too, though. Also really impressive, amazing, culturally significant and important buildings as they get older merit a revisit to the foundations often, right? And because of yeah. the methods and materials that were available at one time, it might go from a sandstone foundation and then 100 years later, a granite foundation, 100 years later, steel supports for the foundation, and who knows, 100 years after that, et cetera. And so yeah, this cyclical thing for sure. Yeah. And then there's good pipers, and then there's pipers who wish they were good pipers. And the difference <laughs> is, no, but there's pipers who want you to think they're good. And then there's pipers that are good. And yes. in, in my experience, and yeah, and then in my experience, one of the key differences between the two is good pipers can handle criticism mm. and they're super used to it. Like you don't necessarily like it, but you can handle it. Like Sometimes for example, it can be useful, right? yeah. And then it's no coincidence that those people are actually good because that's what we're talking about here. So we're. Mm. And I think with your son, a big part of the problem is they're not used to actual real criticism here. Being a, a young thing. human, it's something that yeah. is genuinely new to the experience. Yeah, for sure. And so what you're really doing there is you're criticizing the quality of his rhythm there. And that would be something where if I was playing and you criticize the quality of my rhythm, I would say, okay, criticism there. Now, I, now let me actually think this through. Oh man, maybe Jim has a point here. That kind of, I'm bummed out, but he's right. And in order to move forward, I'm going to have to address that. And so then I quickly get down to work and I have lots of tools I have to like get things back on the straight and narrow. And that puts me in the position to improve very rapidly. Mm. Right. Whereas what do most pipers do when you criticize their rhythm? And it's related to why they think the metronome is stupid because the metronome is a criticizing device. Most tools are, if you think about it. Like yeah. the level, uh, the level, the little thing with the bubble in mm -hmm. the middle that shows you whether or not an object is level. It's that tool criticizes your work, doesn't it? It's like you put the level on the object and it's, oh, it's not actually square. It's not actually perpendicular to the ground. That's criticism. And what that can often mean is you got to start over mm. and get that thing level. Yeah. I, right? th I like very much thinking about literary criticism. Right. Where sure. if you're a little, if you're a bit of an intellectual, the, or, uh, that, that's not really, if you're a bit of an intellectual, it's more if you're, I'm thinking if you're like, have been in the circles of like universities, right. Which I have not been personally. So maybe I should be careful about what I'm saying, but I get the impression at least that for me, when I first heard that term, I would have thought that means reading books in order to say mean things about them. But that's not what it yeah. means. It means reading carefully. Essentially. It means like looking at the context in which this text came about, what were the intentions of the author, et cetera, right? Literary criticism can mean a lot of these other things that you, you can read a text critically because you like it so much, not just to say mean things about it. And so when yeah. you point out that like, these tools are critical, right? Well, I could be using it at the bubble level because I want the thing that I'm working on, that I'm making to be level. So I'm saying, please criticize me bubble level because yes. I would like to find the challenges. And you're asking way, for the criticism, right? Yeah, you, criticism you, as in, you want the criticism. I want to find the problems and fix them. Yeah, exactly. You want the criticism. But have you ever found yourself in the position when you're building something where you avoid the level? To, yes. You don't really want to know. There, to some degree, there is like a, there are probably multiple fallacies of thought going on. One of them is probably sunk cost fallacy, where I think for to sure. myself, I already dug the trenches for this foundation. And I know I heard this, the granite block crack just now. 
I'm just not going to look. If I don't yeah. look, it's not an issue. Yeah. And also, if that cracks, that means I'm not a good builder. For sure. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Which isn't true at all. I think, I think the better the builder, the, especially when it, the better the builder, the more foundations they personally have been responsible for causing to crack. And probably instrumental to that is their willingness to look for the cracks and yeah. pull out that block when they have to. Forget that sunk cost fallacy. You got to do more work on this thing. Exactly. And so anyway, I think the point that we're getting down to here somehow, we yeah. were just talking about, From karate how, oh, we were talking about your son feeling like he was going backwards yep. when, when you asked him to just step back a second and just think about the rhythm, mm -hmm. before, you know, without the keys. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it seems awesome when we're talking about your young son, right? Yes. <laughs> but then it, it's hard to see that in ourselves. It, it sure is. Yeah. And I would just say in my own experience, bagpiping, you know, there, I have rhythmic problems all the time. The good news is I'm so used to that type of criticism and I'm so used to quote unquote going back that I can usually sort out all rhythmic problems that I have. All is a strong word, probably not all, but I can, I think I can resolve 99% of all my rhythmic problems before anyone even detects that they're rhythmic problems. Yeah. Right. Which is cool. I've become so proficient that with only a few exceptions, most of my rhythmic flaws are undetectable. Yeah. Which sounds suspiciously like mastery, doesn't it? Yeah. A mastery of that one skill. There's probably others that have big issues. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely cool. So anyway, where were we in the text there, Jim? Well, so I feel like we've gone way off. Well, oh yeah. We're on page two of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel has established these foundational moves for self-defense yeah. karate, right? And so you point out here that rhythm, we might say, is the words you use are primal and foundational as elements yeah. of music. So these are like the building blocks, all of these analogies we've been using, right? This is how we get started. Yes. And Cannot you, have music without rhythm. Totally. And you point out too that often teachers will actually clap rhythmically to get kids' attention. There's mm. something that pulls us in there. And, and I think I probably have mentioned it on here before because it is one of the things that I like so much. But there's a bass player called Victor Wooten, who, who's also an author who writes really fun books and stuff like that, right? But he's a really good bass player. And he has yeah. been on record on multiple occasions saying, the notes you play being correct is secondary. The That's most right. Never important sacrifice thing. the groove to find a note. Nailed it, yep. And he yep. demonstrates it. He plays the wrong notes in the groove and it sounds awesome. It still yeah. sounds awesome. And so like the groove is number one, truly. It's a huge yes. thing. When I play with the folk band, usually I'm playing small pipes or banjo or some other instrument. It's usually not Highland pipes, but it's something often relatively related. This is a thing as well, right? Where it's, we do a lot of trading solos and stuff like that. And it's like, you know what? Just play some notes, but make sure you're right on with the groove. It's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Like that's, yeah. you can cling to that. You're going to be okay if you cling to that. Nothing is more cringy than when you see a, a solo player, beginner or intermediate solo player, and they do okay solos, but then you see them get up in front of a, a crowd of people and they're playing a jig or something and the crowd starts clapping. And then the solo piper makes a mistake yeah, and just goes back to the beginning of the bar and tries it again. Mm. Instead of just letting the mistake happen and just keeping the tune going, yeah. like that really hurts my soul. Because all, the crowd doesn't actually care about the note mistake. Probably most don't even notice it, but they do care about the groove and the feel. One, two, three, four, one, two. The crowd's getting into it. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the piper makes a mistake. Oh, got to go back to, the, back, back to the beginning of the bar. Okay, now I got to speed up and now my tempo's all over the place and I've totally lost the position and the feel of the music and it's not very good, right? Sacrificing the groove instantly because you're yeah. upset that you missed a small note that it's it's making the way, the blood rise to my face and stuff right now just remembering times when i have yeah. sacrificed groove in front of crowds and how painful yeah. it has been <laughs> me too me too and, and and again any master will have done that a thousand times yeah. and eventually you realize that was a mistake Not but uh, by the way I, I think that just brief very brief tangent yeah i think that's a mistake that judges make as well Mm. So judges are looking for the notes mm. and, and they'll way too harshly criticize note mistakes, despite the fact that the groove is really nice and musical and exciting. 
It's right. both things are important, but maybe they need to switch which one they have as primal or primal, sorry, yes, exactly. premium top. What's the word for the most important thing? Now, rhythm is a difficult thing to talk about. Mm. And it's hard to develop, it's hard to have the language to discuss what's wrong with rhythm. That might be why we gravitate to uh, different things, missed grace notes and wrong notes, because that's really easy to just do an X or a tick box or say slip or something on a sheet. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but I think, yeah, it, it, in the judging community, um, rhythm is hugely important, but it's not often being incorporated into the big picture in the right way. In just this man's opinion, that's mm -hmm. all it is. Internet, it's okay if you disagree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let Andrew know in the comments below if you disagree. So now you do mention here that this being foundational, it's to be clear, it, it, this is not all just to take suck the joy out of music. And, yeah. and, and you mentioned that just about every common fingering ailment is going to be cured by Im improving our rhythm, et cetera. But this is, dare I say it, part of finding bagpipe freedom. Oh, man. It's so that we can get uh, uh, more joy out of the thing. Think about your favorite music. This is an exercise for the world. Think about your favorite music. And my, I think 80% of your enjoyment of that piece of music that you love is rhythmic. I could be, I suppose it's, maybe I'm wrong in some cases, but like my favorite music, it's, I'm feeling it. And my body's getting into it. It's like the timing of it. And yeah, there's other really cool stuff, the chord progression and the emotional feel and all that stuff. But like the timing, man, the timing is what holds it all up. It's like the, yeah. it's like the, it's like the frame. What the, what the music, what the musician is doing rhythmically is the framework. Mm -hmm. And then everything else they do is just going to fill in that frame. It's like, and maybe the rhythm is not predictable. And that's why you like it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not necessarily saying all rhythm has to be perfectly rhythmic. p -rock is a great example. Like that's not metrical, mechanical rhythm all the time, but it's the rhythm and the flow and the phrasing of the tune. And by the way, of the embellishments, especially later in the tune mm -hmm. that makes p, uh, p -rock so hypnotic and meditative and evocative. Yeah. It's not the notes themselves. There's p -rocks in all sorts of different uh, pentatonic scales and colors and moods, yeah. right? But it's like how you present it rhythmically, even though you might not even necessarily think of P-Rock as rhythmic. It's like, that's 80% of the game right there. It is interesting that like, as the movements progress, and I'm not, I'm very much barely getting my toes dipped into the world of P-Rock. But as you say that, I can absolutely see that that's when it turns on for me as I'm listening to one that a lot of the ground is spreading, I don't know, like spreading sounds around for me. And then yeah. those sounds, they don't make sense yet. And then they click into place in those later movements when suddenly there is a dun, da -da -da, dun, da -da -da, dun, da -da -da, you know, something rhythmic that starts happening. That's, yeah. it's like a, something lights up there. That's like the payoff mm -hmm. for having gone through the ground first. For sure. It's, Another great, another potential model of thinking about that mm -hmm. is like tension versus release. Oh, totally. Yeah. Right. So the ground, if done well, presents a certain tension. Now, now it might be beautiful and serene, but you're kind of like, okay, the ground is there. It's usually not climactic. Mm -hmm. It's it's there, and then the variations help lead us to a climactic sort of release towards the end of the tune. Mm -hmm. For example, when the crumble with a mock is just like coming at you either either metrically some people will play it in a metric style but it's definitely usually super flowy and and like relentless and increases in that mechanic in that mechanical rhythm style towards the end of the tune yeah uh it's pretty cool but then just think about all sorts of the other music that you like too yeah it, it is interesting to think about the elements of music and how that you can do different versions of all the elements and some of these things some people will like and some people won't like I just recently finished a book called This Is What It Sounds Like. It was really great. And it dives into this idea of like, why do you like what you like? And if you were to put like a Venn diagram on like humanity, it does seem like all of us might have our own spiraling preferences for, for all sure. kinds of things. But probably a lot of us, m the majority of us have, maybe all of us are going to share this love of uh, rhythm, at least in general, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah, come on. And, Come and on. so you do point out here then that this is 
not just to suck the fun out. This is so that you can, and the examples you give here, play in a higher level band, become a composer, jam out with other instruments, solo compete. Like if you want to be able to do anything you want, have freedom to take this and make it music wherever you like, trad groups, competitive groups, whatever it is. Yes. This is going to let you do that, right? It's not to pull you mm -hmm. back into a cage. This is to give you a tool that will allow you to flourish. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think the sad thing is actual self-expression is not what all pipers are in it for. Mm. I think that's a sad thing. And, and that's a theme of the book. I think not all pipers are actually in this to like see what they can do and to be creative in their own right. And I think a lot of pipers would be happy if they were literal carbon copies of a certain good piper that they model in their minds. But, but yeah, the real goal here, insofar as I'm concerned, if I'm going to teach a, a player to play, like the, the real goal here is I want Jim, when he grows up, to be able to really explore anything he wants to explore musically. And he's going to be, he's going to need to be able to do that to be able to quench his own creative interests. Okay. So rhythm and your ability to actually control your extremities with your rhythmic intentions. That's it. You got to have it. It's non-negotiable, right? So is this the point at which we make the pivot in the chapter where, and I highlighted this, I've got to read this quote because of, this is the quote says, you may be thinking, I can't thank you enough for all that pure unfiltered genius, Andrew. Yes. But how do I actually apply it? Mm -hmm. Is this the point to which we say, okay, so having established through many, many metaphors <laughs> that this is important and foundational. Now, how do we do it? Actually do it. What's this total solar eclipse thing that you talk about? Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's the technique of it, which we talk about a little bit in the chapter, but then there's just like the common sense stuff. So the most important thing you can do rhythmically is to immerse yourself in great rhythm. Mm -hmm. Right. So even just turning on the hits on the radio and just making sure that you're involved in the rhythmic aspect of all, the, all that pop music, that's a huge thing. That's been a huge influence on me. It's just, I like to listen to music and I'm always getting into the music and sometimes I drum along. No, there's no drum score. I just have the fingers going and getting into the meat of it, mm. seeing how tight I can play with the band. Like those are fun ways. And the, by the way, bagpipe music too listening to all world pipe band championship cds for decades and you know, decades on end and i still listen to all the medleys and getting into it and feeling it and thinking about it so the immersion aspect is probably the biggest correlate to rhythmic su success and then we get into like exercises we can do to develop our rhythm mm -hmm. and it would start with just i don't know go on youtube and learn the basics of rhythm and the quarter notes and everything and then one of the things we have to do as pipers from a very early stage, if you play the clarinet, rhythmic accuracy does not have to be as dialed in in the beginning stages as it does when you're a piper, right? Now the uh, clarinet players are going to be upset with you, Andrew. No, but, but no, but I'm correct here, right? So the tonguing, right, and the different types of articulation that you use as a clarinetist right? Allow you to cover up rhythmic accuracy a lot more ah, easily. And mm. I don't mean this negatively. It just seems to be a fact. And I, I actually don't have much experience playing clarinet, but I have played several wind instruments with a, enough, enough to recognize that experience. So mm. when I use my tongue, the period of time that my tongue is stopping the air allows me to switch my notes in a way that it covers up what we would call as pipers crossing noises right? But you, it would cover up any potential like slightly lacking combinations of fingers that might cause that unwanted sound in between notes. The tongue is going to cover it up. And a lot of times we're stopping the air completely and we have a, we have like a literal breath before the next note, right? Which gives us time to make the changes we need to make before the next note, et cetera. We don't have that in pipe, in, in bagpipe music, right? Like as soon as we pick up the chanter, we need instantaneous note changes and we need perfectly synchronized basic grace notes with note changes. We need that right away. Okay. So as pipers, we'll take those basic quarter note exercises and we have to d demand the utmost accuracy, even out of the most basic things. So, and then how do we get that? We have a visualization exercise that we talk about in the book called the solar eclipse mm -hmm. exercise, where if you turn on your metronome 
and you clap your hands and you just clap quarter notes, okay? A great exercise is, if I can hear the metronome, I was inaccurate to the beat, mm -hmm. right? So like, I don't know, hopefully maybe people can hear this uh, in the podcast, okay? And then, so now I'm gonna clap, and if I can hear the metronome, I'm doing it wrong. I'm giving an example of what most beginners sound like when they first start clapping quarter notes. Can you hear the metronome? I can hear, I can it. hear it. You can hear it, right? Uh, and when, when do you hear it? You hear it after each clap, right? Yeah, yeah. So you can translate that and you can say, oh, I'm, I'm ahead of a lot of these beats. Okay, now I'm going to do my best to do it well. Can you hear the metronome? Honestly, it, it sounded like maybe you turned it off it, for several cool. of those beats. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the goal. And I don't always get it right. And I think a couple of those beats, and feel free to rewind the podcast a little bit, and a couple of those beats are still leaking out a little bit. Yeah. But that's all evidence for me in my ears, right? If I hear the metronome leaking out a tiny bit on the backside of my clap, that means I was early. Mm. If I hear the metronome leaking through a little bit on the front end of my clap, that means I was late. That allows me to adjust the timing of my next beat, and I'm always adjusting, always adjusting. But the test that I'm giving myself is I shouldn't be able to hear the metronome at all. That's the goal. That's yeah. the target, right? And so that is a rhythmic, accu like a rhythmic accuracy exercise, very basic. That'll help you understand what you're trying to get to early in the process. I really liked, too, the example that you gave. And in the video version of the podcast, I'll put an image of it here, where how, how you could record these and use the waveform as a visual confirmation yeah. of whether or not yep. you're clapping on time with the beat. Yep. I think that's a pretty darn cool idea. When I got Just to that, don't I was like, do ah, that. an idea. Just don't do that exclusively. Yeah, yeah. So, so music is an auditory art mm. form. I think that's fairly straightforward. Music is an auditory art form. So the vast majority of our exercises should be audio analysis based. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And let me just talk about my kids some more. It has occurred to me that like the wind up metronome, the classic one that waves, that waves back and forth, that yep. is definitely where my children need to start with use of metronome because the vi they've been using their vision so much since birth, right? Being able to see when it's coming back across its arc, that's a big deal for them being able to accurately anticipate where that beat's going to fall. But over time, after learning yeah. to use that metronome, I do think, and maybe I'm wrong, right? If a music psychologist or whoever, whatever kind of specialist would know this wants to tell me I'm wrong, I'd believe them. But it seems to me like then over time, having developed that skill with the help of vision, then they're going to become better at using just a little metronome that's built into the keyboard or on a phone that just bleeps a light or nothing at all, then that light's gone and they're just hearing it. But uh, so I would say I'm going to, I'm going to criticize this. Feel free uh, to, I'm, I'm mostly throwing it out there in case anybody's finding it impossible to get started. If that's like a crutch to get started, but yeah, yeah. go ahead. So I'm going to criticize this. I'm going to say that like hmm, the visual aspect of the metronome that goes back and forth is okay as a starting point. And then I would say as a starting point only, and I would, and the next thing I would say is just using a blinking light as your metronome, never going to work, mm. right? Uh, with the blinking light, there's no way to confirm or deny you've done it correctly. So what I'm referring to here is a blinking light with no sound. Oh, I see. Because I'll see pipers see. do that a lot. I'll see pipers do that a lot. It's, oh, I can't really hear the metronome when I play my full pipe, so I just use the blinky light. So it's not going to work, right? Uh, there needs to be a way for you to auditorily, I know that's not a word, for you to auditorially, audibly, con uh, is it audibly, audibly, auditorially confirm or I know it's, it's ear just, stuff going with, with, with your ear ears. stuff with mm. ear stuff. You need to be able to confirm or reject the results of your of your experiment. Yeah, of your oh, that, that does make sense. With the light, you cannot do that, and you cannot do that with the metronome going back and forth either. It has to. You can use it as a an aid temporarily to help you get to the point where you're hitting those beats. But it's just like the digital tuner. It's like the digital tuner cannot actually confirm whether your drones are in tune or not. Mm. So it can be a useful reference device, 
the and the visual aid can be a useful aid, but it has to be auditory at the end of the day, I think, in my opinion. No, I think that makes uh, and, sense. Yeah, and probably it's helpful to clarify that with my kids, I'm talking about playing piano where they can hear it. And so then the visual is adding to it. So maybe this could be helpful if you're on practice chanter, but then yeah, to, yeah definitely not to rely on it all by itself. Um, but your sense of timing is what we're trying to develop here. So some people are visual learners. Some people, we've heard all of this before. Mm -hmm. Some people are like tactile, some people are audio. And I think frankly, it's probably, all of us are probably some combination of all of them. We're going to always be using those tools when we're learning stuff. So by all means, to start to learn the concepts, right, use whatever tools make sense to you. But then at the end of the day, we need to develop, especially bagpipers, need to develop a really accurate sense of timing. So that's all internal. And, and we're talking about a, a sense of auditory timing, like when things make their sound. Mm -hmm. And so therefore... Like the end result always has to be that combination of what your ears are hearing versus how your brain is processing that. Yeah. I think, I think, I don't know. That makes sense. And, and the dream, of course, is to do this, to work with a metronome so much that eventually you can actually maintain a reasonably accurate metronome in your brain. Yeah. Just be steady when you want to be steady. Turn it on and off as you please. Yes. And that's going to take time and a lot of practice and a lot of self-criticism, but that's the name of the game. Almost poetically, the end of this chapter, very much like the opening of our conversation, talking about this being a cyclical thing where we need to come back to these foundational basics. Just plan on coming back to them constantly forever. This is just part of it. You do say, if this is the first time you, you've been reading this book, you say, keep reading it to the finish first, but then commit to come back to this chapter. That's yeah. chapter five. And dig deep until you've mastered rhythmic accuracy. And that seems like an important attitude to have, really. So let's not say, okay, I did the metronome thing for a couple of months. Never going to have to do it again. Thank, thank goodness that's over with, right? Just yep. plan on coming back to this over and over again, right? Exactly. So uh, rhythm, in my mind, is the absolute foundation of all bagpipe finger work. And there's just no getting around it. Yeah. And feel. And what are we feeling? Like when a musician has feel, what does that mean? Typically what that means is their control of the timing of events is really good yeah that that's the groove feel they, means they can get in the groove and stay in the groove yeah when you listen to a great p-rock player right it's different than the rhythm it's different than britney spears rhythm mm -hmm. right but like when you listen to a great p-rock player and you say wow man he just has he or she has just such great flow what does that mean when you say somebody has flow you're not talking about how good their instrument sounds you're talking about how good their timing is and how convincing mm -hmm. and, and how it grabs you yeah mm -hmm. That's the way I see it anyway. Yeah, I think maybe some of the resistance that we encounter is like this expectation that if you if you learn to play with a metronome, then that means once you've set the tempo for a, a piece you're going to perform, et cetera, then it's set like a robot like that forever. But to be clear, like all of this is increasing your awareness and control over the rhythm in your fingers, right? And sometimes that's you're going to use those tools to vary your rhythm throughout a, yep. a set or a piece, but you'll have that control to do so tempo is so don't confuse tempo with rhythm mm. tempo is just a is just one of the elements underneath the rhythmic umbrella right mm. tempo just has to do with at what rate the rhythmic events are happening right and it could be a slow rate or a fast rate but it, it's just tempo is just one sort of dimension of what we're talking about here when we're talking about rhythmic control we're talking about controlling the timing of musical events mm. right and the beat isn't even necessarily what we're talking about here the beat is the same thing the beat is like a certain type of rhythm it's a certain way rhythm can be presented like just a classic example here it's do waves have like in at the ocean do the waves have rhythm and they definitely do they go in and they go out and they go in and they go out. And after a wave goes out, you know another one's going to come in. But you don't know exactly when, but it will. So the, the waves definitely have a rhythm, but the waves don't have a beat, right? The, mm. A beat is a perfectly predictable, established, recurring pulse in the music, right? And so 
rhythm doesn't, we don't have to be talking about a beat here. We're just talking about how musical events are arranged over time. And then from a bagpiper's perspective is, can we control those things? Hmm. Hmm. Deep. I'm trying to think of any more uh, metaphors that we haven't used yet, right? I want to... <laughs> It's like when you're baking a cake, right? It's like, it's like when the, the shift in the seasons from spring to, to, to summer, how many more things? Have you, ever, have you ever taken apart a motorcycle engine? It's like that. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we need, yeah. Anyway, uh, hit us in the comments with more rhythm-based analogies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>